including uh, Arecibo and others. And so we welcome representatives from those large facilities onto that security team. We've got an email list. They also meet monthly. So if you've got a role in representing, and I think right now we don't have a representative from Arecibo. We have invited them, uh, but I don't think they've, they've stepped up and I'll let Craig correct me if I'm wrong on that front. Um, so if there's somebody who represents Arecibo, uh, they would be welcome, or any of the other large facilities are welcome to join, join that team. Uh, otherwise, we've got a, a discuss community that's pretty much open to everybody. And I was actually gonna go ahead, I've made the request, I don't know if it's happened yet, I did, uh, made the request to get all of you added to that discuss email list as long as, along with our announce email list. I think both are fairly low enough volume, you won't find them annoying. If, uh, if you decide that, that was a wrong move on my part, please let us know, we'll, we'll get you taken off and you know we're, we're learning for next time. But I think you'll find those uh, valuable lists with announcements and everything about um, what's going on. And it's, it's, those are, are good places to sort of ask community questions. And then of course, you know, as fellows, we're, we're working on what exactly the right channel is, but you should feel free to send questions to that fellow 2019 fellows list that we've set up. And we'll watch that. And if you've got, you know, question, you know questions of a technical nature about cybersecurity, um, we can help on that list as well. If you want a little bit more closed group, or if you feel it's really private, you know, feel free to email Dana or I directly, and we can help you on, on that front. Is that helpful, Shavak? Yes, that's excellent. So I think, yes, please, uh, I would like to be part of that and uh, we can kind of communicate on email on that, but that should be fine. Great, that should that should be in the works and um, I've sent the request to the, the support team here and they should be getting you added um, uh, soon now. Probably, I'm a little surprised I haven't done it already. I suspect just backlog. Any other questions from the from the, the cohort. Dana, any other announcements I missed or anything you wanted to, to add? I think you covered it all beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> um, very good, unless there's something else, I think I'm gonna turn the, the floor over to Craig uh, for a presentation, we'll have some Q&A afterwards. And then by the way, I'm gonna uh, we'll wrap up uh, promptly by, before the top of the hour today, because I, I know people have other meetings uh, to go to. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Craig Jackson. So Craig is uh, both a member of the, the CACR team here at Indiana University and a, a longtime member of the trusted CI team and has been one of the, um, the, the real leads within the team in developing cybersecurity programs. Uh, starting first, we've had a, a, a well-used, uh, uh, we call it the CPG, the Cybersecurity Program Guide. And then uh, he's working on sort of the, the advancement of that into the trusted CI uh, framework. So with that, uh, welcome, Craig, and uh, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, and, and uh, it's nice to meet you all virtually. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, let's see, I'm gonna, so, so Vaughn asked me to, uh, Vaughn and Dana asked me to talk about the components of a cybersecurity program. Um, and, and as he mentioned, I've been working on this topic for a number of years. And the folks that I've acknowledged here, K. Avila, Bob Cole, Scott Russell, Von Welch, are only actually a subset of the team that has worked over time to develop um, uh, the, the type of guidance that I'm gonna go over. I'm gonna give you a pretty high level overview uh, uh, of, of some of these core concepts, but uh, promise there's a lot more underneath the hood and a lot more to come. Okay, you all have been introduced to Trusted CI, so I won't go over that in detail. Okay, so just a, you know, basic outline. Uh, one, I'm going to talk about the, just this concept of a cybersecurity program, because what we found over time 
is that while people might throw that term around, that it, it, it really takes a little bit of unpacking to, uh, to express its importance. And then getting more into that idea of there, there being components of a cybersecurity program, I'm gonna talk about the Trusted CI framework. And then finally, uh, Dana and Vaughn have warned me that you all are a very lively group and, and, and are likely to have questions and comments. So I'm gonna try to reserve uh, as much time as possible uh, for discussion. Okay, so cybersecurity programs. Uh, what is a cybersecurity program? There's, I have not really seen much in the way of a third party formal definition. So this is what we've been using. Um, a cybersecurity program is a structured approach to develop, implement, and maintain a productive organizational environment with appropriate levels of information related risk. And, and an important uh, piece here is that we, and you'll see this played out, you know, cybersecurity programs don't come into being and mature overnight. It, they, they, they take time, uh, they take care in nurturing. Um, and you'll see an emphasis here on um, a productive organizational environment, right? We, we fashioned our definition with, in, with the idea in mind that cybersecurity serves some higher organizational mission or missions. So we want the program to, to fit into an organization and serve, uh, serve its needs. Um, a few things that a cybersecurity program is not. It is not a plan. Um, a plan is a written document that says things that you're gonna do. Um, those can be very, very important uh, in developing cybersecurity programs, but they're not the same as one another, right? It, if you've just got a plan and you don't do anything with it, it's hard to argue that you've got a programmatic approach to cybersecurity. Um, it's not a project. Uh, pro we think of projects having beginning, a beginning, middle, and end, all right? And cybersecurity programs live along with organizations, right? They're, they're developed, implemented, and maintained over time. Um, projects can be important parts of a cybersecurity program. And it's, it's also, and this is an area where we see a lot of, of, of I, I think, confusion in the community. A cybersecurity uh, program is more than just a set of controls that you implement. And I'm going to speak a little more to that third point. Um, more than a control set, yes. So th this is a common definition. I'm sorry I don't have the, the reference, but it's a common government definition of the concept of controls. Administrative, technical, or physical safeguards or countermeasures operating within the environment to address a risk, right? So it, one of the nice things about this definition, it's not just limited to, to technical controls, right? It does appreciate the fact that cybersecurity is more than just a technical exercise, <clears throat> but there's still some key things missing, and I'll go on to talk about those. Um, an, another concept that's important to define here is the, the idea of a cybersecurity control set. A uh, control set uh, describes a group or a set of controls that might be appropriate for an information environment, that might be required for an information environment. So examples of these include the CIS controls, uh, that's my favorite, uh, formerly known as the SANS Top 20. Um, Australia is well known for, for their baseline control set. It used to be the top four, now it's the essential eight. And then you have a, a number of control sets that have come out of NIST, including um, the infamous 853. Um, controls and control sets are important, but there is more to a program. Um, so why approach cybersecurity programmatically. Um, cybersecurity is a, is, cybersecurity itself is a dynamic, complex, and multidisciplinary uh, undertaking, right? It's gonna take more than a, than a quick startup process to, for an organization to handle cybersecurity with any sort of competence or maturity. Um, cybersecurity takes time and resources to address competently, right? Um, if 
you know, if, if somebody comes along and says, here's 10 controls or here's 100 controls, make it happen, you're going to have to find uh, time, people, money, resources to, uh, to do that. Um, cybersecurity is always uh, relevant regardless of project phase. So in, uh, in a lot of the science projects that we work with, um, or we work with a number of science projects that are at varying phases in their life cycle. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's very helpful and relevant if you start thinking about cybersecurity early and you think about um, the, uh, the, the, the life cycle for your organization. Is this an organization that ideally will last uh, forever? Um, what is the time scale that you live in? Um, and approaching cybersecurity programmatically, um, among other things, allows for prioritization, right? You're not gonna get everything done all at once. I've said that a couple of times now, but it's worth repeating. And it also supports good project management, right? You can have multiple projects and ongoing activities across time and space to make progress toward a, a state of, of, of reasonable security, if you will. Okay, so getting, moving on to sort of this, the second phase of my slides here and, and talking more about, well, what, what would make up a, a, a solid cybersecurity program, I want to talk about the, the basic structure of the Trusted CI framework. Um, so, a couple of things about, uh, about the motivation behind Trusted CI developing its own cybersecurity framework. There's lots of other cybersecurity frameworks out there in the wild, um, so why would we think that we, you know, that we need to develop uh, our own? Um, the, for me, these are the, the core reasons. Uh, one, uh, the cybersecurity secu community generally lacks a comprehensive, comprehensible minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. Well, I'll, I'll get more to the comprehensive piece, but um, an important thing for us is that folks who make decisions be able to wrap their head around and understand what's being asked of them. If we're going to say, hey, you need a cybersecurity program, we need to express these things in a way that, that makes sense to people who aren't necessarily cybersecurity experts. Um, two, um, existing cybersecurity process frameworks tend to be expensive or impractical to implement effectively. I'm happy to talk about this one more later, but I'll ask you to, 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 to trust me. There's a lot of evidence uh, behind that for the moment. And three, uh, many, uh, sorry, many auditors, leaders, and policymakers confuse implementing a bunch of controls with standing up and maintaining a competent program. Um, and in particular, there's a couple of pillars. You're seeing the, the, the four different colored pillars on the right. There's a couple of pillars where um, a lot of the existing frameworks and approaches that we see out in the wild um, uh, uh, fail to adequately address. So the, the goals that we have uh, uh, for uh, the framework are, um, one, uh, develop an in initial framework implementation guide oriented toward research centers and medium to large scientific uh, infrastructure projects. So it really gets down into the nitty gritty of both uh, what to do, how to do it, what are the great resources for that community uh, that will help them build good cybersecurity programs. Um, to put other frameworks and control sets in perspective. Vaughn. Yeah, Craig, there was a, a question in the, the chat about how a cybersecurity program works with a research compliance office. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, th that's a good question. And that's one of the questions that we always hear. And I, I think when we get a little further in the slides, I'll, I'll be able to point out some specific places where that would be relevant. Um, I would say that, uh, but, but a general answer now is 
Uh, research compliance is, is important, but it's not the, the, the end all be all. I think the folks that stand up and run a cybersecurity program are absolutely going to need to look to uh, compliance folks as, as resources, as guides, um, as important stakeholders. Um, and I, I think you'll, you'll see in our framework how that, how that plays out. But generally speaking, uh, a, what I, at least for what I've seen, you don't, you don't see research compliance offices standing, and standing up and actually running a cybersecurity capability. Two, two other questions in the, the chat. One was uh, it's asked if people can share these slides and I've told them, yes, they, they should feel free to be able to share these. Uh, and then the other question was a question about cloud resources and, you know, pointing out that we use cloud resources quite a bit in research and we make the assumption that they're secure and questioning that, you know, should we be doing that? Yeah, uh, gr another great point um, and, and a really hot topic considering the way cloud uh, intersects with the controlled and classified information compliance topic that's, that's, uh, that's increasingly getting attention and anxiety across the community. Um, again, I think as a minimum standard, uh, the Trusted CI framework will definitely direct folks to think critically about uh, using outside resources. And th that, that goes in, in two directions. One, if you, you, to use good third-party resources, you've got to place some trust or accept some risk. And at the same time, sometimes it's better to outsource capabilities to, to, to organizations that already have a more mature or complete or compliant approach to security. So um, I would say, yeah, cloud is a big deal. And it's, to me, it's not a, uni a universal good or a universal bad. It requires due diligence and some thought. And uh, the group is living up to my, my high expectations with another question. Feel free to work these in later if you want. Uh, I'll summarize this. To, I think the question's asking for, you know, you're making a number of assertions here about what works and what doesn't work and sort of asking, you know, is there, what's the evidence behind these things? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk to the evidence behind any number of, here, I'll go back to this motivation slide. Um, yeah, it, look, I, let, I would propose we come back to that. I, I love to talk about these topics and I'm happy to, but I, I, could, I, could, I could easily go on for a long time. Okay, well, let me say, we'll, we'll let you cover it then in your talk and, uh, ask them to re-raise it if they get to the end and don't feel you have. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, yeah, we wanna put other frameworks and control sets in perspective um, and, and arm in particular the science community that we serve with a minimum standard for a competent mission-focused cybersecurity program. Uh, three, uh, we're hoping to achieve early adoption by a diverse set of stakeholder institutions and facilities. Um, not only to, to be able to show, hey, people are using this, but to have a set of stakeholders who can give us feedback so we can continue to evolve our guidance. And, and uh, then also uh, ideally have a, have a product and an approach that's, that's solid enough that um, we get buy-in from key stakeholders like NSF. Okay, so the, I, pro, I probably only have five to, five to 10 more minutes before we get to, uh, to Q&A, so don't worry. Um, so the basic architecture of the Trusted CI framework, uh, one, what we call the framework foundation is uh, made up of 16 concise, uh, clearly stated minimum requirements for cybersecurity programs. Uh, these requirements are organized under four pillars. Uh, they are mission alignment, governance, resources, and controls. Um, this, uh, these minimum requirements are based on cybersecurity best practices and evidence of what actually works out in the world. Um, 
the foundation emphasizes programmatics that are too often ignored or assumed, particularly those first three uh, pillars. And one of the things that we anticipate is the, the foundation framework, we probably will not need to update with any sort of great frequency. The, the other big architectural piece is uh, we're going to be producing, and we, I've already mentioned, we've got queued up to produce the first uh, implementation guide where we take those high level requirements uh, and break them down for a particular audience. Right. So, so with the, uh, the first fig, we'll be giving guidance that's vetted by and tailored to the open science community. Um, the, the guide will, uh, an important piece of this will be a number of, a, a great number of curated pointers to the very best resources and tools. Those might be general cybersecurity resources and tools, or they may be uh, guidance resources and tools that are, that are very tailored to uh, the scientific enterprise, that we've seen some, some great in innovations um, in uh, cybersecurity, identity management, and related areas that have enabled science while still working to secure it. So we wanna make sure that, uh, that this audience is aware of those and gets pointers to them. And what we anticipate with the framework implementation guides are, are frequent updates to stay abreast of the, the newest, uh, best stuff. <clears throat> so just a little bit about the framework pillars. You know, these are some of the uh, topic areas that fall uh, for us underneath um, these pillars. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if you're familiar with with general cybersecurity concepts, you'll see a number of things that are familiar. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all of those. But then uh, slides, uh, uh, or the next four slides starting with 15 here, these are our current, we're fairly confident in these drafts of these 16 musts or requirements. We've just been calling them the musts forever um, and, uh, and continue to do so. The, these are the mission alignment musts. Uh, there's an emphasis in organizational mission, stakeholders, understanding requirements, which would include, you know, security compliance and privacy compliance requirements. Um, and then uh, three and four are very much about uh, sort of know thyself, having a deep enough and complete enough understanding of your uh, cybersecurity, your information environment, uh, to know what you need to protect. Um, these are the, the governance musts. Um, there's, a, there's more governance musts than any others, and, and we, we suspect that that's uh, just evidence of how important it is to, to really get down to the basics with this one. Um, organizations must involve leadership, must uh, formalize roles and responsibilities for risk acceptance, must have a lead role for cybersecurity. Um, item, uh, or Number four here, organizations must ensure the cybersecurity program extends to all entities with access to control over authority over information assets. This is one of the areas where I very much anticipate that in our, in our implementation guides we'll be, we'll be talking about um, the use of cloud um, in the, the research enterprise. Um, some policy is necessary. You don't necessarily need one of everyone, but to have a competent program, you need some cybersecurity policy, particularly policy that would address these other musts. And uh, going back to the need to maintain the program, there's uh, a must uh, about evaluating and refining the program over time. Third pillar, resources. Um, number one is the, is the trickiest one. Organizations must devote adequate resources to mitigate cybersecurity risk deemed unacceptable by the organization. Um, that might seem obvious, but part of what we do is state the obvious. If, if a risk is unacceptable, then an organization needs to uh, devote adequate resources to address it. Um, must establish and maintain a budget. I'm sorry. Um, just, a, just a quick question here. So all these musts 
are these the responsibility of the cybersecurity program to make the organization understand these and put something in place? Or we are assuming that the organization already understands this and is going to help the program with establishing this framework? Because I think we have some people that understand this and that's where they brought in, okay, we need this program. Now the program is going to struggle a lot in order to try to make sure that the leadership understands all these things. So I think we are kind of in that space. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, that's a that's a great observation and a great question. Ideally, I would like the trusted CI framework to be uh, useful enough, clear enough that if your responsibility in your organization is cybersecurity and you see your organization struggling on some of these musts, that you could be an advocate. You could use the trusted CI framework to, to make your case and to help explain uh, to, to leadership, to people who control the assets, control the money, uh, what you're trying to achieve and where the barriers are. Um, I, I, we certainly do not assume that organizations or organizational leadership, you know, already understands all of these problems. So, or, or, or all of these needs. So we are trying to, uh, with the work that we do based on this material, um, as much as possible, um, make clear the reasons why uh, these musts are important and, and make them, again, comprehensible to folks who, who may have a lot of power, authority, and ultimate responsibility, but may not really be the, the cybersecurity operational experts. Greg, I, right. so I think the way I see cybersecurity experts are going to be able to explain what the risks are. And then from the research perspective, for example, let's say the director of the sponsored programs then decides, okay, this risk is not acceptable to me. And then they should be kind of presenting that case to their leadership so that these resources then can be allocated and again, tie back into the program. But it's kind of like all are tied together and they all need to be on the same wavelength. Yeah, I strongly agree. A uh, couple of related questions here, Craig. Uh, uh, one was, you know, talking about educating the, the C-suite on these issues, right? Is how does an organization determine what their cybersecurity risk tolerance is, right? What's acceptable, uh, what's unacceptable? And then the, the second question, which I'll go ahead and feed you is, uh, what's sort of the timeline to adopt something like this? And are there examples already? Um, to the risk tolerance question, you know, I, I think uh, that that's a tough one. Um, and uh, I believe that from my experience working in different communities that um, a, a lot of, it comes down to a judgment call, right? Um, what I try to do when I'm doing cybersecurity assessments or when I'm trying to convince somebody to stop doing something or start doing something or start spending more money or hiring more people in cybersecurity is point to the best evidence that I can find that supports what I'm arguing for. And if, there's, if the evidence uh, is poor, then I, I don't expect to be very um, persuasive in making my arguments. So I'll, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example that I've experienced I think a lot of cybersecurity people absolutely take for granted at this point that two-factor authentication, especially for like any sort of admin type accounts, is just a no-brainer. It's gotten so cheap and so easy and it's such a great control, everybody should do it. Within the last you know, year, I've had to explain in detail what the benefit, you know, why, why should we care about two-factor authentication? So for instance, the connection of two-factor to mitigating the effects of uh, phishing attacks, which many leaders are kind of aware of that problem, is not obvious. You, you kind of have to connect the dots, right? So um, uh, 
but at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, risk acceptance and risk, risk tolerance, you know, is that comes down to the people in organizations who have the power to make decisions and to utilize resources. Um, your second question. Oh, the timeline for adopting something like this. It, Vaughn, do you, I'm not seeing the questions. Did, was that specific to the trusted CI framework or a question about how long it takes to sort of get to adoption if you're trying to, to adopt a framework? Um, Anshul, it was your question. Do you want to clarify? He says both, please. Um, I think in terms of the trusted CI framework, we've got enough res we've got enough stuff documented, particularly if you're a large facility and you, you may not be working with a large facility, that adoption could, could essentially start now. Um, that said, we are uh, at an important inflection point with developing the trusted CI framework where we are actively uh, recruiting an advisory group um, and early adopters um, to, uh, to really help us, you know, not just develop something and throw it over the fence and hope that it works for the community, but develop it with us and really have a stake in what we're trying to do. Um, and so the, you all have access to these slides. The, the very last slide in the deck, which I hadn't necessarily planned on, on covering, goes into some details, very wordy, about um, some opportunities there are in the community to get to, to jump on um, to jump on opportunity to, to jump on the chance to to be a part of uh, early adoption as well as as influencing uh, and improving uh, the, the framework stuff that we're developing. In terms of how long does it take, I, so I, I have a but I actually had a really interesting conversation with my colleague uh, Kay Avila yesterday about this. My perspective is that an organization can adopt a framework at sort of day zero by uh, mustering the political will um, and the decision making of an organization to say, you know what, we're adopting that framework. That's day zero, right? Is hey. We, we looked at this, we believed in it. We may be following other guidance here and there, but this is a good foundation for us. We're adopting the framework. What it means to successfully align your program, that may be a much longer story. And that goes back to the comments I made about approaching cybersecurity programmatically. What I would encourage organizations to do is decide, are you gonna adopt this framework or any other framework and then develop plans that allow you to make progress on the the musts that are uh, that you you ha don't already have squared away and um, best case scenario an organization could do this quickly I've seen organization I've seen large research organizations that have gone from very immature to getting very serious about cybersecurity um, for, for lots of good reasons, including being successfully attacked. And it still takes years. It's not, you know, you're not gonna knock this thing out in a quarter. It takes time, particularly if you're trying to find budget money, particularly if you're trying to hire people. I don't know about you all, at Indiana University, it takes a little while to hire people. And then when Vaughn is setting the rules and it's like, you have to be extra rigorous about it. So those, <laughs> those sort of things take time. Um, and so that, that's why I emphasized earlier um, project management. Uh, large facilities I've worked with who've had a lot of success maturing their programs after we've engaged with them have done a really good job of setting out plans with milestones prioritizing we're going to what's most important to do first what are our long-term goals and trying to just make steady progress in building their program over time um, you know and frankly celebrating the little victories as they go because there's a lot to get done uh, we've actually got see at least one more question in here uh, now two more uh, 
risks evolving over time. So what happens, how do you budget for risks that you may miss when you start the program up? <laughs> um, how do you budget for risks that you may miss? Well, I, I would think you're going to miss risks. I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of trying to like catalog every single possible risk. Um, I think, I'll tell you what, how I think Indiana University does it. You know, not CSR, but Indiana University. Indiana University has an enterprise risk management approach. And cybersecurity is one of many, many lines, you know, or, or sets of lines inside of its risk registry. Indiana University uh, has a tremendous reputation to protect, and it is self-insured. And, you know, I suspect if, if things really went wrong, you'd be looking to, you know, you'd be looking in a lot of different directions for help, whether it was your insurance carrier, um, your own pocketbook, uh, law enforcement help, so forth and so on. Um, but put, put, put another way, I, I suspect that many sophisticated I think probably in some other verticals, finance being one, I would suspect that organizations have considered cybersecurity when they think about what their war chest is. Um, and they've, they've uh, to some extent, set aside resources expecting to have to spend more or take more agile action at some point in the future. And I realize I'm, you know, I'm just one person sitting here, you know, giving my opinion. And, and unfortunately, we I work in a space where I can't always name names for some of the organizations that I've, where I've seen this happen, but I'm gonna, trying to give you guys the best responses I can. I just, just, to fin just to finish with that question, sorry to, I, I was referring to, for example, if at the time of budgeting, uh, there's many things that you, you don't know, and there's many incidentals. Is there any rule of thumb that you can say yes. in your yes. experience, like 10% or 20% extra just for incidentals? Man, you know, if I saw an organization be that specific, I mean, they would be getting so many hugs from me. Um, <laughs> the, I will say this, there... Uh, primarily led by my colleagues, Scott Russell and Bob Coles, we wrote a paper where we looked, and it's a couple years old now, but I think it's useful. We wrote a paper where we looked at all of the cybersecurity benchmarking studies that we could find. And we looked at their methodologies and made some determinations about which studies we think were the most rigorous that you could rely on the most. And so this is a fairly short white paper that is really just all about uh, budget benchmarking for cybersecurity. And it's not super long. And I would, I would really recommend checking that out because, you know, for a lot of, you know, benchmarking, you know, knowing if you're in the middle of the pack or not, you know, is not necessarily the best like long-term goal, but if you're trying to get a short-term hey, where do we sit? We're spending, you know, X amount of our IT budget on cybersecurity. Do, how do other people do that? Where do we fit? Um, I, I, would, I would start with our short white paper as a starting point. It can be, you know, it, going back to the to talking to leadership, if, if your cybersecurity program is seriously under-resourced, you're, you're feeling that it's seriously under-resourced, considering the risks, considering the interruptions that you're experiencing, you know, benchmarking information like that can be persuasive. You know, hey, we're falling behind the pack or hey, we, we, want, we want to be leaders in this space and we're clearly not, just look at the numbers. Um, I have, I, I just have one more slide and then I'm, very happy to keep you know, answering questions and stuff, but I, I wanna hit it in part because it's just one more slide. Um, you'll notice uh, frame, the, the last set of musts here, the, the last pillar is controls. Only a couple here. Um, 
Organizations must adopt and utilize a baseline control set, and organizations must select and deploy additional and alternate controls as warranted. Um, the reason for number one is, you know, we, Trusted CI is not in the business of developing baseline control sets. The reason that we're not in the business is uh, there are some very good ones out there. So many organizations have a baseline control set dictated to them, so you just may not have a choice. You're going to have to do, um, you know, some more, you know, if federal organizations are going to have to do, you know, at least 853, you know, uh, the, the base, low baseline. Um, and then if you, if you have the ability to choose, uh, there, there are some really strong prioritized evidence-based uh, control sets out there that you could choose. Um, not that you have to treat them as a must-do checklist, but you can adopt and utilize that baseline control set um, as, a, as a really good starting point, especially for your just traditional IT needs. And then uh, item two, this circles back to mission. Right, uh, organizations must select and deploy additional and alternate controls as, as warranted. And so a lot of things will go into, into that calculus. But um, alternate controls can be, for, we, you know, working with the open science community, alternate controls to the standard old way of doing things can be, can be very, very important considering the very open, collaborative, federated types of environments that we work in. Okay, I, I hit all my substantive slides, so thank you for, for letting me get through those. We are officially at questions. That's so thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, um, if I may ask, so one of the key things about implementing any type of security, I think is, um, not just having this buy-in from the major stakeholders, but especially for research. So let's say if you're a separate ent entity in the university, um, there are certain aspects of the cybersecurity that need to be met in conjunction with some of the other technical teams. So for example, to me, security cannot be done in isolation without considering networking, for example. And so networking is a, let's say, a central entity and they are completely focused on enterprise goals and research has a very separate, uh, you know, regulation based needs that need to kind of comply with that may not necessarily translate into enterprise. So how do we go about kind of getting what we need to establish for the researcher, but for the research community, but mm, somehow in an independent fashion, I don't know what's the right way to ask this question, but because, you know, we are being governed by different goals as well as different timelines and uh, deadlines, and that's completely different from um, some of these other kind of entities in the university that may not necessarily be ready for this right now. Um, and because they, they're not directly, let's say, supporting the research goals. Um, so how does this framework help us in that? Um, I think for you, the, you know, the single, so, so the must that I go back to is organizations must identify and account for cybersecurity stakeholders and requirements. Um, and just that, that very first must about tailored to the organization's mission. And I think uh, key here is uh, cybersecurity personnel, whether they have that official title or not, uh, do, do have to play a horizontal role of coordinating among multiple groups um, and understanding different perspectives. So um, I know that when we, when we do assess, I, I, I'm involved in a lot of cybersecurity assessments. When I do assessments with a science organization, it is always very valuable to get some of the researchers in the room and say, what are your right. concerns and talk to them about it. Why is this annoying you? What are the problems? What are your greatest concerns? Um, and uh, so I, I think, you know, get, getting those voices to the table, um, you know, to, to me is, is step one. Um, 
I also think, and I strongly suspect, I don't want to put these, these guys on the spot, but I, I suspect that you'll, you'll have some other sessions that really go to this as you, as you move forward um, in your fellowship. But um, Trusted CI and, and uh, very much under uh, Vaughn's leadership it has and continues to do a lot of work focused on um, understanding what are the what truly are the cybersecurity risks to the science mission, right? And talk understanding um, how this world of cyber threats actually could disrupt what is most important to these communities. So I, I'm not sure if you've heard of the, the Open Science Cyber Risk Profile. Um, it's a mouthful. It's all about um, engaging uh, the, the science mission and thinking about what is gonna be most important for the cybersecurity program. Yeah, I think what happens sometimes it gets lost in the translation where compliance is so focused on compliance, but the primary goal is to advance the research. It's it's you have to focus on the capabilities. What is it that the research is trying to achieve? Because when you ask the researcher, which we did as that first step, no one tells, hey, I need a compliant <laughs> this thing. All they talk about is what they need to get the research done. Yeah. So the compliance expert is supposed to allow them to do that and understand that the, you know, the, the primary goal is to facilitate the researcher to do their best possible research, but minimize the risk uh, that needs to be, you know, so yeah. I think that's going to be a challenge. You know, I, I will, I, I completely agree. I will say this, that, um, you know, if you work in an environment, in an environment, where the cybersecurity function is separate from the research compliance function, and those can be different voices, I think that's a good thing. Because from, from, my, from my perspective, too often sci the, the, the CISO, you know, the cybersecurity people are put in a position where they're supposed to secure the, the mission but they don't actually have the power to do much of anything, right? All they can really do is make recommendations. But I, th I think uh, it, one of the things you'll, you'll see here, th this is very specifically worded under the governance pillar, the third, the third must, organizations must establish a lead role with responsibility to advise and provide services to the organization on cybersecurity matters. We could have said, um, a lead role with responsibility to secure the organizational mission. Well, that would be that would be a mistake, right? Because ultimately, you know, responsibility to secure the organizational mission flows up. That's a leadership uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. if it's delegated. If it's delegated all the way down to the CISO, you're going to where we've seen that you're going to have problems on your hands. So, similarly. If you've got a compliance officer that can can be that voice of gosh we've got to be compliant and you as a security person or as a champion for uh the the the, the getting the balance right um I, I think that is a positive even though it's challenging right yeah i think i would let other people ask so maybe i can follow up in emails if that is okay so uh this is Jay. Uh, I want to follow up the question that was just asked. So, in, just like any other uh, priorities, initiatives, or programs in a university or any organization, it's, it's a matter of resource uh, and um, staffing and mm -hmm. convenience and so on and so forth, right? Um, I think that I saw your framework. I, I think this is not a criticism, just more of a practical thoughts right so so this looks very challenging for to my knowledge that for most of the organization to to really do all of these musts and is that a good approach so that's my question right so is that a good approach to say do all of this instead of say here are the faces that you do it i mean you must have thought about this that why presenting this 20 i don't know what the exact number 20 musts 
or do you present here are the phase one and phase two? So, so what are the trade-offs in terms of kind of pushing towards this eventual framework? I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question and something that, I'm gonna take a note of that. Something that I do, we don't want to get lost in the fact that we're presenting 16 musts is, is this idea, look, it's gonna take time, right? And it, you have to phase this out. And, and so, you know, if, if the optics of this or the guidance we give says, you gotta get this all done starting like right now, uh, I don't think that's the message that we wanna send. I will say this, I have worked with organizations that have serious, research organizations that have serious cybersecurity challenges who have addressed successfully almost every one of these musts, but they just, that, this, that, was a, that was essentially a really big first step for them. So, um, you know, if we set the, we're trying to set the bar as low as possible and actually express what it takes to have a competent cybersecurity capability. If we set the bar too low, um, I, I would be very concerned that uh, others, that, that stakeholders would, wouldn't, wouldn't see anything they could buy into. So, so that's a good point. You say that you have examples of that. Of course, that you cannot, you're not at liberty to share all the details, but you might want to think about that. Success story is important because most things on the street, right? Is now, we cannot do it now, we cannot do that. If you show, demonstrate success story in a formal way, you know, of course, that may be not necessarily uh, divulging details. That may be helpful. Uh, like here at RIT, that we talk about how to do compliance and this and that. I can see all these challenges between resources, phases, how do you get this done, get that done. Earlier talking about the researchers versus the compliance, all of those things that are everywhere, right? How to demonstrate a success story, I think that, or multiple success stories, will be, will be probably essential to, to expanding the adoption of this. Great point. Great feedback. Thank you. So the, this is this is Vaughn again, and I, I I really hate to to break into this conversation because once again we've got a lot of good questions, and uh, uh, which is really wonderful. But I also want to respect the fact that folks have got other things they need to do um, at the end of the hour. So um, I'm going to answer one quickly, then Craig give you a chance for closing comments, and then uh, wrap us up. And uh, Jay, you asked if there's been any study demonstrating differences in cybersecurity requirements for different types of organizations, different science disciplines, uh, which is a great plug for our speaker next week, which happens to be me. And I'm going to talk about, um, I don't think I would quite go so far to say it's been a formal study, but I will talk about what the Trusted CI has learned um, in, in that regard next week. So. I'll answer that that in. Um, Gabrielle, good good comments here. I think we've got a couple things left. Um, I'll ask folks, you know, please do feel free to send an email to the list and we can um, do follow up questions with that. Craig, thank you very much for your time here today. Any closing thoughts? No, I mean, these were the fantastic questions and uh, you know really enjoyed engaging with this group so so thank you and 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 I'd be very happy to to get you know follow-up questions or or just a debriefing on uh, if any of you know if there's any uh, other follow-up with the fellowship program mm. good uh, I see another closing point on the musts is uh, you know training not being listed there so I'm I'm, I'm going to unfairly not give you a chance to ask answer that, um, but just say that was was pointed out, and maybe we can take that up in email. Uh, Dana, as I wrap us up, any closing comments from from you? Um, no, this is just great. Thank you, Craig and and fellows and Vaughn. Um, great discussion. Okay, all. Um, We'll look forward to reconvening uh, in one week, same time, same channel. So that'll be the Tuesday after Memorial Day and I hope everyone has a good Memorial Day 
uh, weekend. And um, I'll look forward to talking to you some about these, these differences between cybersecurity for science and other types of organizations. So with that, thank you everyone. Look for you in uh, email between now and then. Otherwise, look to see and hear you all again uh, next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.